today about monitoring a little bit. <clears throat> um, I am known uh, somewhat as a monitoring Nazi. Patrick can attest to this. My favorite thing in the world is to turn around to people and say, yeah, I already know about that. I'm working on it, as opposed to them coming to me and telling me. So today we're going to talk a little about how we automate uh, monitoring here uh, with Puppet. That's where I want to be. That's not where I am. Next slide, please. <laughs> I'll settle for this, all green. We call these the big green circles. This is what I want to see. If they're not green, I turn to Juan over here and start carping at him and say, hey, dude, why aren't these green? So we keep everything green. It's a basic principle that everything is green all the time or is excluded. Okay. Mm. The requirements for choosing our monitoring software were it has to be rock solid. I don't want to get woken up because monitoring doesn't work. And I don't want somebody calling me to tell me something's down and me not knowing. I always want to know first. Taran can tell you this. I hate knowing, I hate being the last person to know. Okay? Automate node addition. Discovery of new nodes. I don't want to have to put in every node manually because if anybody's ever seen me type, <coughs> they'll tell you I make more typos than is humanly possible in a short line. It has to scale horizontally. We, we run on EC2. EC2 has no I.O. Think of it that way. I.O. sucks. Live with it. Work around it to scale horizontally. Much, much easier that way. And I want dependency models. And I'll go into that kind of in more detail later. The other thing is easy to write plugins. I want any of these developer guys that I work with to be able to write a plugin in 10 minutes to check their app to make sure it's working properly and that it's something that will consistently work. Um, same workflows, okay? For the longest time, it was just me. Now it's me and Juan here. And uh, if any of you guys are looking for a job, come talk to me later. We're looking for another guy. Um, but we need to have something that scales out to multiple ops people to handle all these issues. And we like a nice, pretty front-end view, especially for Tarn. He likes his pretty graph porn, so we've got to make sure we have that. And it has to be flexible. We need a lot of flexibility. We do some weird stuff, and it would be nice if our monitoring system could kind of do that with us. <coughs> Tool stack. Puppet, obviously, we talked about before. Ichinga and Nagios. Ichinga is just a fork of Nagios, basically, and we use Nagios and RPE really heavily. So I don't know if any of you guys follow monitoring sex. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of people don't like Nagios. Matter of fact, one guy that we used to work with said he's been making sweet love to this piece of software now for eight years, and he hates it with a passion. Right? I think he does it wrong. But there's other arguments about it. There are other tools that do automated discovery and collect data for you for free and stuff like that, but this was what met our, what our requirements at the time. Okay. In defense of Nagios, it's been around since 1996. It's very solid. Right? It has service dependencies. Plugins are very simple to write. It's just the exit code, basically, in a single standard line out. It's kind of easy to troubleshoot once somebody sits down and explains all the crazy stuff that we do. And it is rock solid. There's no doubt that this is the most solid piece of monitoring software out there at this time. Okay, what sucks about modules? There's no automated discovery. You have to edit text files to put in a new host, right? How many of you want to do that? Because usually that's the step that everybody forgets, right? It's complicated to set up. Yeah, it is kind of nasty. I'll definitely go with that. And it's text files. The front end is not too pretty, and the development of Nagios itself was really slow, and Stacks Collection is just terrible. Next slide, please. So the solutions are use Ichinga, use Puppet to configure Ichinga, take the stats and leave them to Graphite. For sake, that's what Graphite's good at. Right? Don't try and put it together with monitoring. The other nice thing about keeping these separate is if there's a problem, you just turn off Stats Collection. Let your monitoring work. You don't have to have them too tied together. You want, you need monitoring all the time. Stats, they can go away occasionally. Sorry, Tarn, I didn't mean to say that out loud. But. And then, you know, big boys and girls learn how to use their tools, really. So, Ichinga is a fork of Nagios. The configurations are completely dropping compatible. You can take your current Nagios configs, drop them in Ichinga. You might have to change one or two names, and they'll work. So, you don't have to worry about it. If you've already learned Nagios, hey, great, use Ichinga. Okay? It's got a little more solid architecture. They separate out the uh, front end web and the core, and then you have a database. You can use databases to store your data. It has a mobile front end, which is kind of nice. You can see it on your phone when you're getting a call at 3 o'clock in the morning without getting out of bed. And you can use NRP. We'll go into what we use that for a lot. All right, this is kind of ugly, but this is kind of how it works. We take Puppet here. We use it to configure our Ichinga nodes. We have three now, thanks to Juan, who built the third one. We use Puppet to basically configure Ichinga from the bottom up, so that if we lose an Ichinga node, we just replace it. Okay. 
Ichinga runs NRPE to do a lot of checks against our application farm. The Ichinga nodes report back to this IDO DB, and then the front end is used for both looking at the web and looking at on device. There's two different, there's a, uh, there's a web, uh, Ichinga web front end, and then there's the Ichinga mobile front end. It's a different install, and you have to play with it a little bit to get it working. It's kind of complicated, it's not documented too well, but I definitely recommend it because it looks much nicer, as you saw earlier, than the regular old one. Okay, so we use uh, Puppet standard types to configure part of Ichinga. So we package everything, right? We've had this argument a couple times. Tarballs don't cut it. It's got to be packaged. If you guys are familiar with FPM, you can take a directory and turn it into a package in how long did it take you? Uh, like a minute. A minute, right? Guy who never packaged stuff really before. Yeah. He was packaging stuff with FPM in probably 20 minutes to the point where it was actually usable in production. Mm -hmm. You can take Python pip installs and turn them into Debian packages. You can take Debian packages and turn them into Ruby gems, right? very very convenient software and it makes packaging so much easier and when you package your software it deploys so much cleaner with puppet okay and I cheated I don't have a <laughs> I don't have an app server I just basically copy out the dev and I just uh, and I just pull it off and install it that way so, yeah I know that's uh, <laughs> sorry I will get an app server up soon um, things that I can figure with the standard types just straight files because these don't change very often and they're like obscenely complicated. The basic Achinga CFG file, which is the main file, uh, Apache needs to run on the box so that we can view it locally if we need to. CGI auth is who has access to what. For example, Tarn, we give access to some things, and then the ops team has access to everything, and then the sales guy actually has access to the uptime reports. Um, templates, you can use the built-in Najo classes. I don't, I got lazy. And then the IDO mod is a template because each backend reports to the database as to who it is. So you know, oh, I'm on three and I say this, I'm on two and I say this. So that you need to use a template and then you just replace the host name with the fact or fact and you're all good to go. There are a bunch of built-in Nagios types. So for example, contacts and contact groups. So our con one of our, we use PagerDuty. Did anybody, did anybody here use PagerDuty? You guys started using PagerDuty? Okay. PagerDuty basically calls you. Really, it's a nice robotic <coughs> voice at three o'clock in the morning that calls mm -hmm. you and tells you exactly what's wrong. It's very annoying. Yeah. <laughs> you? Yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean. So I had uh, the ringtone Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Everything is broken on my phone for a little while for Nadjo's pager duty, and it wasn't funny the third time. I think it went off in the middle of the night. My wife was like, "That's not funny anymore." It was funny the first time. But you can have contact groups. So we have this contact group called Panic. Panic means page the shit out of everybody right away, wake everybody up, make sure everything's good. Right now, everybody's me and him. But uh, it, it does, and PagerDuty also handles escalations nicely. If we don't respond to the incident, they'll call Tyron, and then Tyron will call me. So I don't think that's happened yet, has it? I haven't picked up. You haven't picked up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The other thing that's very important, time periods, right? 24-7. There are some things we support 24-7. There's two guys, right? We support our load balancers 24-7, right? We support all this stuff. Then there's work hours. Our IRC, internal IRC server, I don't want to pay his three o'clock in the morning for our internal IRC server, you can call the guy for Pete's sake. So you break it up into different tiers. So make sure, and then this notify classic, uh, Ichinga server execs, you can notify classes, which I didn't know until very recently. Those are execs that go in and change the mode of the file because there's bugs in the Nagios file types. It sets in the 0600, so you can't read them if you're not root. And it also just makes sure all the file permissions are correct in the Ichinga. So that's one kind of little nasty workaround that you kind of have to do. These are all the puppet types. Uh, contact, contact group we showed, host, dependencies, which we'll get into big time, commands, and then some of these ext info. I don't use these. Do you guys use ext info at all? Uh, ext lookup? No, you don't no. use ext info. No. So it's like, if you have external people viewing your nodules, you can put in prettier information about the host and what it does and stuff like that. Since only ops and the, the, the VP of product look at them, I don't bother with that too much. So configuring hosts. So basically how this works is the application node comes up, it contacts the puppet master, puppet master puts it in the database, and then when the monitoring server runs again, it pulls that information out of the database and writes it to disk. And it looks kind of like this. 
we'll, we'll go into kind of all the little bits. That's cool. So, so store configs is a puppet feature where you can take information from one node and propagate it to another node. And there's a quite, we use it for a few things. We use it for uh, hosts. So instead of running DNS, we actually populate the host files using this. So we have a jump box. Say on the jump box, take all of these hosts that we know about and put them in the host file. We don't need to use DNS, so it's not externally visible. So basically, in the puppet config, config you turn on store configs and thin store configs. And thin store configs just stores less information in the database. Uh, we run our database on RDS. Did anybody use RDS here? It's not really fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't admit to it if you can avoid it. So it's basically Amazon's uh, MySQL database offering. It's pretty slow, kind of a little unreliable. Um, and then basically you pass it some information about the, the, the database. And when it runs, it stores these resources in here. OK? And you, do, you basically do this on the Puppet Master. So you export the Nagios host resources, right? So export basically means save them to the DB. Take this information and write it to the DB. So there's all this insanely complicated logic here that I'll get into, but this is the line. At, at means you export the resource. So it says, take the fully qualified domain name, the host name, and the, EC, the, the IP address, and write it to the database with these tags, okay? The, the whole bit up here is, in our external node classifier, we say, we go by customer. So we'll take our customer Macy's and we put the monitoring cluster one. Okay, we take, we have all these different monitoring boxes. So just by adding a line into the puppet dashboard, we take a whole customer and we move their monitoring to another box. Okay, so that way we can spread out machines really easily. Uh, and then there's this uh, monitoring off. Sometimes clients don't pay us. <laughs> and when they don't pay us, we stop monitoring. Right? Uh, Kind of fun. So, if in the case of a client, it's like we had one client who went out of borders. Borders is our client. Borders went out of business. So, I don't really want to get paid in the middle of the night for a company that's out of business. So, we turn their monitoring off. So, you can do this. And then here we go by region. So, in the west, we use the internal IP address because our monitoring server is in the west. And on the east, we use the public address. Okay? Uh, the other pro tip kind of is use these targets. And I'll kind of go into why we do that. Host groups and tags. Next slide, please. Ooh, that terrible. <laughs> this is the example of the ENC. You see here that we give it this mon cluster two, and this one's not tiered, so basically it's a tier one customer. So we just say, you go on mon two, you stay there. Then you, the nice thing is that fact. Can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. So that mon cluster fact is here. It's a global fact that you can use in your in your um, manifest, so you don't have to have the actual data stored in the manifest. You have it stored in the ENC, and then just pull it off. And I do a lot of this. If it's set, do that. If not, set it to a default. Um, and then we also oops, go back. okay. We also have our software versions in the ENC. We have um, so we have this uh, the memory limit. We use that for uh, Monit. You guys use Monit to run processes. It's nice. We say, hey, if you hit 400, 425 megabytes of memory, kill the process and restart it. So we can monitor our processes this way. And these things are automatically propagated into your manifests. So targets. Um, this is from the Ichinga config. You can give it a configuration directory. You say anything in this directory that ends with .cfg, pull that in. All right? The reason why I do this here, you have uh, hosts. The reason why I do this is you write one file per host. Right here, the host name is on the end of the file. And the nice thing about that is when you want to remove that host, you don't have to go into this huge file and find the line you're looking for. You just whack the whole file. So we actually have an M collective agent called whack host that runs a few things. And it goes off to all the monitoring boxes and just looks for this file. And if it's there, it removes it. And then pups monitoring, and then we're sure that that host is gone from monitoring, we don't have to worry about it. So definitely use the configuration directories to make your life a lot easier. Okay? And also the default is a terrible place. Host groups. So the nice thing about host groups, you take a host, you add it to a host group, it inherits all of the monitoring checks for that host group. So uh, you can see here that we have, we set the monitoring host groups to generic. 
And generic is a host group that checks things like CPU, load, memory usage, uh, disk space, and a couple other things uh, like is, is Puppet running, is mCollective running. So you have like this generic that you want across your whole infrastructure, everything goes in there. And then we have a role. Each machine is assigned a role, like varnish server or application server. And then those host groups pick up, those machines and those host groups pick up those checks for things like check to make sure the process is running, check to make sure that uh, you can resolve this DNS thing or not. So we put it in the group and then everything gets inherited. So example host group, and then when we define these services, like NRPE ping, we say, hey, go in this generic host group. So any host in there picks up that. Tags. Tags are a really nice feature that came out in 226, I think. And the nice thing about tags is you can say, um, this, uh, this tag, Nagios Master, is mon cluster 2, right? And then on, I'm sorry, mon cluster 1. And over here I can say, not, this is the import, this Nagios host, where you import from the database, and you can say only import stuff with mon cluster 1, and mon cluster 1. And then on mon cluster 2, only import the stuff for that one. So you can take resources and tag them so that you only pick out what you really want. So that way you don't have one huge pool and you have to figure out which ones you want and which ones you don't want. Okay, services and commands. Exactly what you want to monitor, right? All the other stuff was kind of boring, but these are the actual checks. So we have this NRPE ping. So if any of you guys are familiar with NRPE, you just ask NRPE, are you running? Right? And the reason why I do that will become painfully clear in a few minutes. And it says, this is the check command. That this is the command I want you to actually run. This is the description that shows up over here, host NRPE ping. Use client service. So client service is basically a template that says, you know, run every 30 seconds, do this. If you fail three times, then execute your notifications. And I put it in this file. And when you change this, make sure you change all the file permissions on the chain because we still have this bug. And the command that we talked about, check NRPE. Because what's NRPE? NRPE is the not just plugin. I'll, I'll kind of explain what it is in detail. Basically, it allows you to remote run remote commands securely to do monitoring checks. And we'll talk about that kind of in real detail. But it says, this is ensure present. And then this is the command line. This is what actually gets run. And this is a, itching has macros, user one. It just says, this is the path. So it actually runs check on RPE dash host address. So it picks up the IP address from the host file and runs this actual command. So if you're not sure what's going on, you have a problem, you go to the monitoring box and you run that command by hand to see what happens. And usually you can figure out what's going on really quickly. <clears throat> okay, next slide. And what does ensure line do? Ensure just means set this state. You can set ensure absent means remove it. Or ensure present, make sure it's there. Or in the case of the service, like ensure that it's running. It basically says to Puppet, run this state. Make sure that things are in this state. Okay, service dependencies. <coughs> Say you have host C depends on a service on host B that depends on the switch. When your monitoring goes off in the middle of the night, do you want 6,000 alerts? No, you want to alert for what's wrong, okay? So if your front-end web server depends on your middleware software, which depends on the switch running, you want to get the alert from the switch, right? I like it to figure out what's wrong for me so I don't have to think about it. Next slide, please. So dependencies, when you use them, unreliable services. There are certain services in the world that are unreliable, okay? Cut down the number of alerts, like I said, and tell you what's really wrong. And the other nice thing is you can route alerts accordingly. In the past, what I've done is taken certain alerts and sent them to the application group at 3 o'clock in the morning so it doesn't even page me. So you can actually, if that's the actual problem, you can have it page them instead of you, and you can stay in bed. So our current infrastructure looks like this. We have our front ends, we have an application server pool, and then we go off to our clients and fetch information. We're a proxy that takes a web page and turns it into a mobile page, basically. So we rely on our client's upstream site being up all the time. Occasionally our clients go down for maintenance or they have issues or whatever. So that causes everything to back up here, causes problems here. So I don't really want alerts there. I want to know that the client site is down, that's the only alert, and I set it for non-critical. So for a client who doesn't pay us for 24-7 support, we get a notice that their site is down. Yeah, you wake up in the morning and you see it, and you fire them off an email. You don't get woken up for something that you don't need to get woken up for. 
So service dependencies are, are quite ugly. <laughs> so you have your basic service check load, right? And um, that's an NRPD command, which I'll, again I'll go into. So this is your service, this is the command that it actually calls, and this is the service dependency. So it says, I, I depend on NRPD ping. Now this can be on another host. If you don't specify a host here, it'll go on the same host. So you can do, like if DNS on your host doesn't work, don't bother telling me mail doesn't work. I know it's not gonna work. And this critical, this here means that in the case where this one is critical, don't alert for this one, just alert for the main one that you depend on. So as you can see, you stack up these dependencies with logic and, and have it nail down the problem and keep the number of alerts down for you, much smaller. So NRPE runs on the client. So every single app node that we have and every single server that we have runs NRPE. Uh, runs over SSL. Yep. Yeah. Could you expand NRPE? Uh, Nagios Resource Plugin Executor. Okay. I think that's what it's called. It runs remote commands. It's pretty freaking cool. You could SSH in and run the commands. This is actually a lot faster, and the handshake's pretty quick. There are newer plugins that will go and execute all of your plugins at once. We do kind of each one separately, and that's something that I'll have to kind of work off in the future. Um, you can set who it runs as. Mine runs as nobody. Yeah. And what is uh, the benefit over, like, just run, like, SSH minus C? Because you, then you have to build up the SSH session, tear it down, and you have to have keys that can access something else. Right. And this you secure with Apples. It's much tighter than running SSH. So I don't want people to be able to remotely SSH into my machines without any interaction. Does it talk uh, to its own daemon? Yes, it's its own daemon that listens on port 5666. I know I'm because I remember that. <laughs> OK, and you can run commands, and it's useful for other things. So, okay. so this is the actual configuration file that we write. And for most of our puppet configured files, I like to put puppet control file on the top. Because when Mr. Z over here goes in, or Dr. Z, sorry, goes in and changes the file, if he sees puppet controlled at the top, he knows it's going to get overwritten in the next 30 minutes and he won't get angry with me. <laughs> okay? So you say, hey, run on this port, run as these users, and then you can set the hosts that are allowed. So we only allow our monitoring hosts to connect to NRPE. So you, can be, you have this extra layer of apples on top of everything else so that you're sure that only the machines that you want remotely executing plugins are executing plugins. And the running is nobody, so they can't do too much damage. They can still do damage. And then we include the generic configuration that we run everywhere. And we include this directory. So with a new service, so if it's an app server, we drop another file in here that runs all the application level configs. And these are just, means we, of course it's packaged. And we rely on these packages. We have a class base OS, like Patrick said, same idea. You know, basic things are installed, uh, postfix, SSH, NTP, all these things are there. And then the generic config file, we actually drop in. And this is a neat trick for those of you who are kind of newish to Puppet. You can actually provide several different files. And this is something that we do a lot. This is the fully qualified domain. So if I want to overwrite a configuration on a specific machine, I create a specific file like Apollo dash at v zero one dot move web dot net dot generic, and it will pick that one first. If it can't find it, it goes to the role. So it'll look for like application server. And if it can't find it, it goes to this default generic one, which is really basic. So this is a good way to overwrite uh, node specific stuff if you have like 500 nodes. And it's, <coughs> it's fallback? Like you yeah. have to import the other ones if you this want one, to? This one, this one, this one. So the first one that matches is the first one it takes. So normally you'd like import the default or something or some sort of way to do that? Like you can import and stuff, but this is just, I use this for basically overwriting. So for example, when we were moving to 64-bit, uh, some stuff doesn't work right. So I just created a, a 60, I had a, like a architecture 64-bit command. And so it would pick different like ways to find memory usage and stuff like that. And then you require these classes up here. And again, you notify, you chingo, or you notify the client that you have to restart NRPE whenever you're done. And this is what the NRPE file actually looks like. So it says, hey, check DHCP. So these are the plugins that are installed by default. There's a lot of them. You can write your own ones. It's really easy. And you say, hey, if there's more than one of these processes running with DH client 3, or there's less than one, then basically you alert. So these are the commands that you run. It comes with a whole bunch of plugins, which I'll show you a site later. And then in that command that you run, you said, you said dash C, check disk. 
and of course that one's not here. But if you had done check our syslog, it would actually run this command here as the user nobody. You will get tripped up by the user that you run as if you do stuff as root a lot. I found the same problem. So you have to kind of be careful there, but I think you'll eventually leave it. But the nice thing is you go to the box and you can actually run this command by hand and take a look at the output and it'll tell you what's wrong right away. So plugins. Exchange.nagios.org. You can use Nagios plugins in Ichinga and they work. And as you can see, there's a lot of them for all kinds of different things. You know, you got hardware, ticketing, who is, inventory management, all these kind of different plugins that you can just kind of download, take a look at, and install. They're really easy to write, right? You output one line to standard out, and you give an exit code. The exit code of two, critical. Exit code of one, warning. Zero means everything's okay. So all it does is check the exit code of the script that it calls. And this is just an example script in Ruby to go, log into the IRC server, see if you can do a who command, and an exit. So one of the tricks is always set your exit code at the top to one so that you warn if the script somehow fails. And then I usually do this put exit message and exit code at the bottom. So that, that way I'm sure that it ran the way I expected. And if you're not sure, you just run this by hand. And you can look at the output and realize there's a typo there. I'm an idiot. And then you'll be done. So the workflows that we use using our current system. This is kind of the dashboard. And you look at this, okay, there's 442 hosts. There's 7,084 checks being run. There's two database, there's two machines checking in. Now that's three, thank you, Juan. And then there are these filters here. So there's a critical here, but there's nothing shown here. Looks like. So the nice thing is you can schedule down times. So you say, uh, I know the server is going to be down because <laughs> I'm upgrading it. So if you go in ahead of time and set the downtime, it, it doesn't alert you, doesn't send email, or doesn't call pager duty. So uh, if we know there's a problem with one of our clients, their upstream servers are broken. We set all the alerts to downtime for two hours so we don't get 60 million pages in the email. Okay? And it tells you who did it, and there's some comment. And then here we have these filters. You can say, hey, if it's if it downtime is no, if it's not in downtime, then show up and alert so that we know what's going on. And then we have our on call schedule, which looks pretty <laughs> <laughs> So it's Chris and Juan. That's pretty much our on call schedule. It re repeats forever. But um, PagerDuty can accept not just emails and go, and there's also an API, which is written in Perl and doesn't work so well yet. Um, Still playing around with that? Okay, quite kind of work. So basically, you can alert who's ever, who's ever on uh, duty, and then page your duty falls back to the next person if they don't answer in a certain amount of time. So I think monitoring is awesome. I love it. Save my bacon more often than not. Main thing remove unreliable checks, right? If one of your developers <laughs> writes an unreliable check that fails half the time, you start ignoring it, you get in the habit of ignoring errors. You don't trust your monitoring, you don't pay attention to it, something bad's gonna happen, it's gonna bite you in the ass. I have written zero checks. I know, that's <laughs> not very encouraging, by the way. So, you've done this, I've done this, pretty much every ops guy knows ignored something in monitoring, and then basically spent the rest of the next day in meetings explaining why you ignored something in monitoring. You have to be disciplined, and you have to make sure that your, the people that you're providing service to understand that if they can't provide you something reliable, then it's, it's just not gonna work. Uh, just monitor. Don't bolt on extra crap. Don't try and do inventory with monitoring. Don't try and do stats collection with monitoring. Separate them. Clean, efficient, discipline. Tier your monitoring. Like I showed you, IRC server, you don't want to get woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning for that. Figure out what services you have to provide. We had this issue when I was the only ops guy. I was on call all the time, so we went through and we tiered certain services so that, hey, this is not something you get woken up for. And it will make your life a lot simpler in the long run. I'm a nicer person when I sleep. I know you are. Right? Time periods, again, part of the training, delegate responses. Right? Call one once in a while. Don't always call me. Right? And use dependencies to pin down the problems quickly and make sure that they're the actual problems that you want to fight. If you constantly notice the same thing going wrong, then move it to an unmonitored tier or just have it sent email to your to your ISP provider. They love getting automated. Right? Work smart. Save yourself trouble. That's where you want to be. Green circles. Sleep all night. 
That's really hard to see. Um, <laughs> so Ichinga site, I'll, I'll put these slides online later so it's easier to read and go through. Uh, NRPE, uh, IRC, these are some good. This is my email address, Twitter. I'm usually in Pound Gaijin on Freenode. Uh, and special thanks to uh, Yvonne back there who kind of organized this whole event. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, Michael Catlin, uh, the voice of MoveWeb right there. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Juan for helping out. And Anthony, uh, Anthony for reviewing the slides. Thank you, Anthony. Public uh, Labs and Chinga Team, and thanks so much for Patrick for coming out tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, again, if you have an idea for, you want to do a talk, 15 minutes, brag on your infrastructure, tell us something cool, definitely send me an email. We definitely want to do this again. So, um, are there any questions? That was a lot of stuff. Yeah. What do you use? You mentioned uh, scaling horizontally yeah. for uh, Ichinga. Yes. What, what, how do you, what do you use for that? I mean, so, uh, we just build a whole crap load of Ichinga servers. So, whenever we start noticing that the um, the things go, so, mm -hmm. go back up. Yeah. Go back to the ugly graph with the hand thing. Oh, oh. Sorry, I don't do pretty, I do efficient, okay? The pub is you don't do it pretty, you do it open source. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's one with the on the left side, there's like somebody holding a phone. The diadrum. Oh, this is fast. <laughs> <laughs> there, stop. That that one. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So basically, what you do is all the Achinga boxes report to the database. And then the front end reads from the database. So, what we do is we just add more Achinga boxes to do all the monitoring. Um, what I found in the past is that if you don't use NRPE and use like SSH, you might get 100 hosts per Achinga box if you do a lot of checks. You see, we do about 7,000 checks for 400 hosts. Um, yeah, that's better. Um, it depends, and you can also do passive checks. So in the past, we've done this thing where the app node sends a heartbeat back to the <coughs> server, and the server just listens. Um, you can also do passive that. That's the slide. Yeah, I make big. <coughs> the the slideshow, uh, the menu. Yeah. There you go. So right here, we just increased the number of Ichinga nodes reporting back. Uh, eventually, we'll run into the problem where our database is too damn slow, and then we'll have to move to hardware. Um, but you can get RDS pretty big, and this doesn't have. This isn't real fast, reliable. So I'm okay if it's slow, as opposed to our application. But I think we could probably get to about 10 Ichinga nodes before my head would explode. And since they're configured by Puppet, we add new ones all the time. So you could you could cut the number of checks if you if you wanted. To. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and I mentioned NRP. We also do one other cool thing with NRP. So we use uh, M Collective to run all of the NRPE checks on a single host at a point in time. So when a developer deploys to production, they don't want to look at monitoring. They want to know right away. Got to know right away. So M Collective goes out and go out to 100 hosts. Actually, can go out to all of our hosts, which is 400. Can run set, uh, actually, it's it's 10,000 checks in that case. So we have special checks that we only run that way. So we run 10,000 checks in about 10 seconds across all of our infrastructure. So you can use the, that plugin is on my GitHub. Uh, feel free to download it, use it, ask any questions you have about it. Do you do any like app tier configuration where one app component relies on another and you need data from each other to share across before they start up? Um, no. Okay. Well, we we kind of do that. We we um, so our load balance. So you check in with the load balancer. Mm -hmm. So I kind of really cheat here. Um, right. yeah. What I do is I use uh, host files and that target thing. I actually mm -hmm. create a special host file like Etsy varnish customer name dot hosts. And so you have a special host file. Whenever that gets changed, I run a script that parses that and generates the varnish configs, hubs varnish. So that's kind of the only time where we have one node relying on another. Uh, in the case where you have that, you can order things really well, or you can just wait two months. <laughs> so when's a good idea to use event handlers? Because I know we don't use those. Yeah, so event handlers are nice if you have, like, you have like some piece of crap uh, legacy s hardware or software that always dies. So like, oh, if it alerts, then re then run this command, restart it. So you can actually say, hey, try three times. If it doesn't work, restart it. Try that two more times. If that doesn't work, then alert. Um, so in that case, I tend to use Monit for that kind of stuff. I like 
the way that that handles it better than Nagios. Um, yeah, when I worked at one bank, we had this feed handler that would go down all the time, and we used it for that to just try and restart it every once in a while. And you can actually do other things like, you know, mark that note or take that note out of the load balancer. So you can run these commands when you alert and do other things. I don't, we don't use it at all. So, and by the way, you're fired for that question. He <laughs> 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 doesn't care. Any other questions? What happens to NRP when, like, whatever you're checking, is there oh, a there was a timeout of 60 seconds in there. That says if your command doesn't run, yeah, if your command does NRPE by default times out in 10 seconds. Okay. So usually the NRPE check will, and then I had the NRPE ping where I just, so when NRPE on the box dies, I don't want like all these checks alerting. I just want that dead. So that was the service dependency example that I showed. And you can, um, there are also some other people have written things that just run NRPE checks basically okay. for you. So that's the server that gives up after the timeout. Yeah, the server just says after, you can increase the timeout in that command line. There's a dash T flag. So if it's like a long running check, I had there was one on the um, on the the old system where it was like a, a five minute check basically to generate this report. And so you can set the timeouts really long if you need to run like a really long check. And the other nice thing is you can set the frequency of the check. So you can say, oh, run every five minutes, run every ten minutes, run every hour, or uh, like your check it runs once a day. So and then you only alert. Um, how do you handle monitoring across data centers? So um, we monitor right now only in the West. Um, so we basically you, we let NRPE tunnel over over the internet. So you put all of your Archinga nodes like in some. You're on EC2, you said. Yeah, we're on EC2. So like all your Archinga nodes are like within one availability zone, and they're like talking. Yeah, they're talking the to the other ones. ones. Yeah. So okay. normally, what I would do is I would say put them like Oregon or somewhere where you don't use. It's better to have things go over the internet because you can do you can also do active checks where you like try and fetch an HTTP page or stuff like that. I didn't mention active checks because they're really common, and so you can say like you know fetch this HTTP page. And if you can't get it over the internet, then you probably want to know about it. But you can run like a local one to do local stuff, and then you can run one further away to do only end-to-end -end checks. And that's something I didn't talk about like. Uh, what we do is we do an end-to-end -end check. We, we try and get a certain page from the customer and it goes through a whole stack. Uh, those are nice, right? But you remember we had this end-to-end -end KPI, key performance indicator thing with one company and um, it, that was the only thing they looked at. So you didn't know what was failing along the way. You only knew that the end-to-end -end was failing. So you can use another Ichinga server somewhere else to do your end-to-end -end checks if you need to. D does that mean that you're exposing NRP? Across the public internet, or are you well, no, because the firewall it, it's firewalled basically. And the nice thing about it is it does use SSL, so it's encrypted. So and it runs as nobody. Well, but in, it, yeah, okay, but encryption is not authentication or authorization. No, it is not authentication. But and also you have that ACL list, so you can tie it down even further. So there's firewall rules, ACL lists, run as nobody. It's not perfect. Uh, and if somebody goes in and puts like echo this to Etsy password on there, it runs as nobody. If they change it to root. The nice thing about that is, Puppet will freak out and change all that stuff. So, and if it change, if too much stuff changes, then Puppet, and then we actually get monitoring alerts for that. And it's not something new. It's been ready to, in practice. Yeah, it's years. been around for a long time. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely somewhat of a risk, but I definitely think it's worth it in the long run. I'm pretty happy with it. Any other questions? Okay, well, there's still some more beer left than some pizza. So. Oh. One last thing, since the company paid for beer and pizza, I have to do the pitch. So uh, we are now currently looking for one uh, mid to senior level DevOps guy. You are looking for? Uh, DevOps, uh, NetEng, and DBA. Right, at Brightroll, this is the better place to work, obviously, because I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick is also a fun guy to work with if you like cheap vodka and plastic containers. So, uh, our site is moveweb.com slash blog. Uh, wait, is blog.moveweb.com? Which we will put up these slides in probably about half an hour. And there's also our job post is listed there. And it's brightworld.com slash jobs for you guys. Indeed. And any other questions, find either one of us on IRC. And we'll be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you very much for coming.